start with this. Um, Joe, how do you go about adapting a single issue comic? What's so funny about truth, justice, in the American way, and make it a full-length feature film? Uh, I, I was really lucky to be asked to get to do it. You know, DC had suggested uh, the story to Warner's as the, the next feature, and uh, I was lucky in that it was a while. It was a while ago that I wrote it, and um, so that was the younger me. And I could look at that guy and say, "Okay, you're going to tear that apart and start something new." And also, I had Alan Burnett uh, working with me, who was really incredible. Um, he was just you know, definitely give it up for Alan. Uh, he was an incredible sort of mentor in the process. So, you know, it was what what was important to the story. You know, for us, it's uh, is Superman relevant? I can't see you guys at all. Uh, is Superman relevant in today's day and age? That's that's the the heart of the story. That never changed from the comic to the uh, film. But what had to change was the sort of inside baseball of Action 775, because that was really much more about the superhero universe and Superman in context with superheroes. So we wanted to expand it to uh, hit a different kind of audience. So Alan and I talked a lot about how we we're going to do that and bring it to the sort of world political stage seemed to make the most sense. Um, and then it was a long process of just writing a bunch of stuff and uh, having him tell me what was good and what wasn't. And luckily, had a good guy help me out. Any additions you needed to make, or uh, you and Michael uh, maybe conspired to uh, put together into this that you're particularly proud of? Uh, I, I'm. Uh, I do like the uh, the Rocky and Bullwinkle Superman opening. Uh, yeah. I'm very fond of that, uh, where we had to just undermine Superman sort of right off the bat, and uh, just the. I mean, the action sequences are incredible. I mean, the. Um, the comic, I was when I went back and looked at it, because I hadn't read it for a while, and dissecting it, you go, I, we, we realized how much you talk about battles. Like, you see some of the stuff at the Elite, but most of that stuff is off-panel, and uh, we really had to flush it out with more, uh, more action. But the character stuff, too. You know, Lois plays such a big role, and, and Lois is, uh, uh, you know, her performance is incredible. So uh, those scenes really flush it out for me. Michael, does this give you enough to work with? I mean, uh, uh, you, it looks like you've got the, the crazy opening credits. You guys like those opening credits? Woo! Woo! Rocky enough? And then you've got the, the, uh, the Rocky and Bullwinkle uh, cartoon animation, and then you've got the full-on with the skull and the elite. Yeah, I think it was, a, it was a good juxtaposition, little... Humor and to offset, <laughs> <laughs> offset Superman and the message. Uh, uh, it was a great script to begin with. And, uh, Joe, Joe did an awesome job. Thank you. Character designs on this. Who was doing the character design? Uh, John Suzuki did the character designs. Uh, he designed uh, all the characters. We wanted to make it a little different take than that what you're used to seeing. Um, so. Uh, we couldn't exactly follow the comic because it's beautiful, beautifully illustrated, but uh, it's not animation friendly. So we had to come up with something. Uh, I think we tried to come up with something a little more expressive and a little uh, something what, that would help the story. Yeah, Doug, Doug Monkey's art, uh, and you guys hopefully all know who mm -hmm. he is because he's super genius. <laughs> His, his art is so detailed and so nitty gritty, and you know that stuff just wouldn't have translated. But the the raw energy that's in that, I think you guys really hit in those character designs, which is critical, I think, for the story because it's really emotionally packed as well as action packed. Robin, what was the inspiration for the voice for Manchester Black? Um, I just got a touch of Johnny Johnny Rotten. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and actually, uh, Johnny Depp's starting to speak like him. <laughs> Might be taking the lead from you. What's that? Might be taking the lead from you. <laughs> um, I, you know, when, when we when we uh, first met on it, we decided, well, obviously, you know, Manchester Black, he's got to come from Manchester, have a Manchester accent. Uh, but then we realized that, uh, you know, if you really had a strong Manchester accent, a lot of the American audiences probably wouldn't understand what the hell you're saying. <laughs> so, um, I took something that was based in that Manchester region and just kind of expanded on that. 
and just made sure people could understand you. There you go. So, did you understand me? Yeah. Woo! 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 yeah. Not, not to mention the fact that I tend to write a lot of words, and uh, you rattled off some of those oh, yeah. impossible sentences. I don't even want to know how many times you uh, you had to say some of that stuff. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, that was the great thing about the, uh, the character, like Michael said. I mean, you know, every every great project starts with great writing. I mean, and you did an amazing job of uh, creating uh, an exceptional script. And then Michael's direction, done deal. Yeah. You have that guy Bruce Tim working with all of you. I know you, you guys like Bruce, don't you? Yeah, we do. And he's not here, so we can talk about him, and nobody will hear about it. <laughs> Anybody you have any unusual or uh, popular experiences on this project? I just remember telling him in the middle of the uh, to one of the recording sessions. I looked; he was, you know, he's always there, sitting in the back. And I said, "Bruce, thank you for this role because this is like he's super cool, this character." So, any particular input that you guys got that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Michael's forgotten the project completely. <laughs> Maya, the notes that I got that were production notes for things like, um, you know, in the comic, Lois and Clark, when they sort of have the scene where she says, I don't think you can beat them, and, you know, the night before, they're in bed in the comic, and so it was the, please don't put them in bed. No. <laughs> for all the things that we get away with in this uh, film, which I think really earned its PG-13, uh, I had to laugh that they couldn't actually, you know, a married couple be in bed together. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, you know, I, I would get little production notes like that that were sort of love, love Bruce. <laughs> uh, what was the genesis of this story? Was it easy to revisit? Uh, yeah, the, um, you know, at first I, I, I was curious to see if, if I was going to be able to contemporize it because the, the initial story behind Ashley 775 is I was reading, uh, I, I read a lot of comics, I read a lot of dark comics. I write dark comics, and um, there was just the the vibe at the time was really trending towards darker anti heroes, and it's something we've been dealing with really, you know, since the '80s. And I, I love all that stuff, but there was a particular uh, issue of a comic that I just felt it crossed the line, not not because of the content or anything, but it, it sort of made me feel like if you believed in any of this truth, justice in the American way, you're an idiot, you know, and. At the time, I was working on Superman, and I just felt like there had to be another voice. So that was that was the genesis of the original issue, and I wrote it really fast, and because uh, I was mad, and I can write fast when I'm mad, <laughs> and uh, and wrote it with cursing in it and everything in it that I knew we couldn't do. And um, Mike Carlin, who was editor in chief at the time, took it and and was giving it to. He got the script unblemished, and he had a red pen and the nose starting and the circles and. And then by the time he's on the like second to last page, he's digging trenches in with the pen. I'm like, no, Superman does not do this. And and then he finally realized what the point of the story was, and was like, oh, all right, I get it. And then and then he backed it, you know, so long as we took out all the language and stuff. So then adapting it, it was just, you know, will that would that still work? You know, is this still a story that that people want to see? And you know, I feel like. I do. I do believe in what Superman represents. I really. It sounds corny, but I. I mm -hmm. enjoy. Woo! It. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Uh, I like. I like knowing that there are those kind of heroes out there because we we just live in a in a world that's so saturated with darkness and there's evil everywhere and there's a bad guy in every corner and everybody's corrupt and uh, if you don't have hope, you don't have anything and that's what Superman represents for me. So it, it actually became more timely than I kind of expected. Um, in the writing of it, you know, I, I didn't really expect it to reflect kind of current events the way it did. Um, so I, I, that's sort of serendipitous, and you know, you can take it as a good thing or a bad thing. But uh, you know, I still believe in Superman. So, mm -hmm. all right, so Joe, Woo! Joe, Joe yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Woo! it's Woo! okay to clap. Mm -hmm. We're celebrating. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Uh, Joe kind of got into it there. How about you two? Do you agree with the Superman sensibility, or do you side with the elite? I'm just going to side with the elite. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say Superman. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's got to be conflict, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you are the villain or the anti-hero. Right, How many, uh, you know, uh, Andrea Romano, if she were here, she would say, Woo! Robin, yes, you can yeah. applaud for Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Woo! If, 
if she were here, though, she would tell you that Robin has more dialects uh, that he can do on the drop of a dime than just about any voice actor out there. And, uh, and, and you can see it in the films. You've got uh, Robin did uh, a couple of voices for us earlier. He did Harvey Dent in Batman Year One. Yeah. He, did, uh, he was Alfred in Justice League Doom with those great sarcasm, funny tete yeah. tetes with Batman. How, how many dialects do you have in there? I don't know. I, usually, I think it's somewhere out there that I do over 60, but I think actually it might be a little bit more than that. I don't know. But that's, that's all, all around the world, you know, and some of them sort of blend into other ones, like, you know, you're Romanian and you're Hungarian, to No, they don't get along. I wouldn't do that. No? <laughs> Truth, justice, and the American way. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put your hands on your hips when you do that. I kind of like flying around with my hands in my pockets, actually. <laughs> I, I was saying that earlier. I mean, that's the first superhero I've ever seen fly around with his, with his hands in his pockets. <laughs> it's a skill. Uh, you guys want to ask any questions? Because I might give prizes to the four best. Or not, if that's the case. That was the have we got somebody up there? Have we got people lining up? Yeah. Okay, so the job you have is state your name, then ask your question. Okay, my name's Crows, and first of all, that movie was so great, I must say. I enjoyed it, I'm sure everyone here enjoyed it. Woo! Woo! Thank you. And when's it coming out again? <laughs> we love Crows. That's the kind of question that gets you a prize. <laughs> Crows, that uh, uh, Superman vs. the Elite will come out June 12th on Blu-ray, Combo Pack, DVD, On Demand, and for Download. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you now, thanks. Now, my question is for Joe. Now, Superman is a character with such strong convictions in terms of, you know, morals and, you know, good and evil. Is it easier or harder to write someone that sees in such black and white in such a contemporary world where, you know, there's more than just black and white? Uh, well, for me, it's... Th that's the heart of the character, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the whole point of this show is for him to to question those those morality structures, you know, like he, it is simple for him until he's confronted with the elite, and confronted with actually, you know, regular people appreciating what the elite do. That throws him off to the core, and, you know, when Lois says, like, hey, yeah, maybe I would like to see terrorists kind of killed, that would be okay by me, you know, like, it just totally messes him up. But, but as a writer, is it, like, harder for you to, you know, try and get into a character that's just black and white instead of, you know, no, because I think I think that there are shades of gray within Superman. You know what I mean? He goes to those places in this story, and the challenge is to find the, an organic way to get him there. You know, so it might be a little bit easier. I mean, black. You know, characters are a little bit straighter ahead, like a, a Batman, for example. Like in some ways, you have to outthink what the character already is to get into a place in the story. So it's you know, it's the same with Superman. It's, to keep him interesting and contemporary, he's got to question himself. And that's where I think the shades kind of come in. Um, at the end of the day, he's going to still land at that point in the spectrum that he's comfortable on and that he really represents. But you take him for the, you know, for the crazy ride. And you know, theoretically, if this universe kept going, I think you'd you'd have a Superman who's like, all right, I, you know, I proved a point here, but I have to sort of address the realities of this world, you know. And I think you would see a different Superman as a result of this story. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Hi, my name is Dan, and uh, my question is for Robin. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of yours because you've done so many great villains, like in Thundercats, and <laughs> specifically for me, the Uncharted video games. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, how much uh, freedom, creative freedom, has Michael and some of the others given you in order to perform or voice uh, Manchester Black in, in a way that you would feel comfortable or uh, make it your own, so to speak? I, I'd say pretty much total, total freedom. And um, uh, Don Hershey, who was uh, directing also, um, you know, uh, like I said, it was very important that they got the accent right, but as far as uh, the character development, I pretty much was free to um, explore, you know, 
as I want it to, and, and you know, of course, uh, you, you do a couple of takes and then let you know whether it's okay. That's great. <laughs> Moving on, you know. So, yeah, was it wasn't anybody sitting on my back saying no, you know? <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is John, and my question is really for Joe. I actually never had the pleasure of reading What's So Funny About the Truth, Justice, and the American Way, although probably buying that tomorrow now. Um, as far as Atomic Skull goes, was there a specific reason that you, I, I don't know if he was originally in the book, was there a specific reason that you used him, that you felt that he was a character that particularly complimented or served as an excellent catalyst for the story, or...? Yeah, but have, you know, part of, I guess that was a, an answer to an early question about how, do, how did we expand on the story. Um, we needed to have a, a series of events that, that showed pretty clearly, okay, this is Superman's MO, and that illustrated Manchester's point, you know, this sort of revolving door uh, prison idea that we're kind of used to in comics, you know, like, you gotta have the guys come back, you know, you wanna see these villains again. But um, we wanted to physicalize it, and that was also the introduction of the Baxters and the Professor. You know, so it was something that was really going to hit him, hit him hard. So uh, Atomic Skull is not in the original comic because a lot of that is kind of taken for granted because the audience who the comic is written for it gets that already. It was no question. Um, we wanted to make it part of the story, and originally it was actually a parasite. Uh, there were reasons that we had to change it, but um, the, you know, the Atomic Skull turned out to be pretty cool and scary. You know. Uh, but yeah, that, ultimately that was the point, it was just we really wanted to illustrate that, that arc of he catches a guy, puts him in jail, he breaks out, and bad things happen uh, in the context of the story. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, hi, I'm Alex, and I was just wondering, um, anyone who can answer this, just uh, about the production, since uh, there's so many, so many months until the actual DVD release, is this the final product, or are there going to be any tweaks or anything, depending on audience reaction today, or just any editing later? Yeah, we're yes, going to put we'd, more we'd like, uh, Yeah, we'd like you to all fill out the cards that are underneath <laughs> your seat. You are seeing a print. We, we posted this last Friday, I think, and uh, this is pretty fresh off the, off the run there, so they got to make copies and make the DVDs and get them into your stores, so that's why you're seeing it now. It yeah. timed out perfectly. Well, thank you for showing it to us on the final thing. Oh, you're okay. welcome. Woo. I hope you liked it. How's it going? Uh, my name's John, and uh, I'm a big fan of that Superman versus Doomsday featurette that they had a couple of years ago, and I have to say that this was way better than that original movie. Um, I had a question for you. During the storyboard sketches of the United Nations that were, you know, figuring out what country was fighting another country, what was the motivation in real life crisis that you guys took from that to make it kind of realistic? Is that a storyboard question? Or? I don't know if that's a storyboard question. <laughs> I, for, for me, just from a story point of view, um, Again, we were trying to externalize it and make sure that it wasn't just sort of superheroes versus superheroes thing like it is in 775. So I wanted to, we already had some of those uh, states in the DCU, you know, Pecola Stan we used in the Superman universe and, and Bialy I think we made up in there in too. And um, it just seemed like a way to do, you know, let's take an, an international conflict and put them on that stage instead of it being, oh, the Superman, you know, the elite killed a super team here or they killed another super team somewhere else. It just didn't feel like, it felt like it would have been too small, so we wanted to have that conflict feel bigger and, and a little bit more, again, contemporary and, and real for a new audience. So that was from the story side, I don't know about for... Uh... Um, most, uh, everything was on, in the script, and you know, I just interpreted what I felt were uh, the important story points and um, uh, how, how to get that across clearly, as clearly as I could. It really starts with the script. Yeah, one, you know, one of the things that um that I, I've been I've taken heat for in the past is using these uh, these characters for stories that are a little bit more political or that address some real world issues. And and some people would prefer sort of straight up you know escapism. But I think that these characters are really great vehicles for for that kind of real world exploration. And there are definitely hints you know of real world scenarios in this 
in this film, uh, you know, without question, and, and lines of dialogue that, you know, are, are sort of hit pretty close to home. Uh, I think that's important. I think that we can use these characters for that kind of thing, and um, without being uber preachy, it's the hope that it's entertaining as well as makes you think a little bit. So that's again the real world context helps with that. Thank you, John. Hey guys, hey guys, my name's Ken, uh, great work. Uh, I guess my question is mostly aimed at Michael. Uh, I know this isn't something that gets asked about a lot, but one of the things that really caught my eye was that absolutely mind-blowing opening title sequence. Um, I'm guessing that it was sort of like Super Friends meets the Sex Pistols, <laughs> which was kind of awesome. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about sort of what the concept was there, as well as uh, uh, who did the music for that. It was fantastic. Uh, to be honest, I, I had nothing to do with the title sequence. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, I think it's great, but um, uh, I was not part of that process. I actually drew the whole thing. I, just, <laughs> I sat down, I photocopied some Super Friends stuff. Yeah, and I was playing guitar. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was done in-house, and um, the stock music that we, uh, we pulled out to rock and roll the place. So, credit Bruce Kim and uh, the folks that we're working with him. That was amazing, thanks. My name is Vincent Swain. Um, I, I have a question about um, what made you guys decide to produce this movie now as opposed to earlier or later? That's a great question. I mean, I you know, it, for me, for you know, on the on the big corporation side of it, I could not tell you that answer. But I know that the other movies definitely had to come before this one. To I think you know they test the audience. They sort of know like what the boundaries are to get us to where we could do the things that we did. No question. Like you could not, we couldn't have done the movie the way we wanted to do it if there hadn't been Batman Year One before that and Doom and all that kind of stuff. You know that each one kind of got a little edgier and a little uh, harder. So you know for for me I think just they had to wait until they were willing to pull that kind of stuff off. Yeah. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Vince. <laughs> Hi, my name's Maria, and I just wondered what was your favorite moment in this for all of you? I think my favorite moment was uh, on the Kent farm. And, uh, Clark is having a heart-to-heart -heart with his father. I thought it was very poignant, and it was the quiet moments I think I'm drawn to, because that's really the heart of the story. I mean, the action is fun to draw and fun to come up with, but uh, I think I, I, like, I like the quiet moments because it really tells tells you about the characters and what they're going through. Yeah, I also like that too. I like, uh, you know, when you see the background of um, Manchester and his relationship with his sister. Um, visually, there's something about that shot when um, Superman is about to punch uh, Manchester Black. That's a really cool shot right there when it's all sort of balls and all that tension like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much stuff I, I love in it. Uh, that moment at the end when, when Superman comes out and he's talking about uh, how you could hear cold cast explode and it's like pop and you see that face with the messed up eye. That is one. That is scary as hell. Uh, that's a pretty cool moment. But I, I also I really gravitate towards those quiet moments. I mean, I just, I love... Uh, every Clark and Lois scene, and especially when she's really no, not just giving him a hard time, but working as a real partner with him, and um, and that that scene before the big showdown where she's like, I don't think you can beat him. That's you know again, it's sort of uh, pulls at the heartstrings. So I, I love those quiet moments, and a lot of times you can't get that done in animation because you can't. It's hard to do sort of facial expressions and, and sell them. And I think the guys did an incredible job. They really you know sold even if it was silent, <coughs> sold those moments. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jake Hayward. Um, you know, the movie was great. You know, not a typical superhero movie, SmackDown. Um, I had a question for Robin, and my question was, you know, through the through seeing it, script right through reading the script or um, performing, did you have a moment where Superman was going to kill Manchester? I mean, did, did you have that moment where you're like, oh my god, he's going to, 
he, he's uh, so evil. He's gonna he's gonna really kill him. He he's following his own rules. <laughs> that makes any sense. Uh, my answer is eighteen point seven. Eighteen point seven. I'm not sure I'm I'm quite clear on what you what you're saying. But uh, did you think that? Did I think that Superman was going to kill Manchester at yeah. some point? Yeah, like as you read the script. Would it be? <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. I mean, usually a lot of the times we, we don't get the scripts ahead of time, and it's on the go. So, yeah, I was excited. I didn't know what was going to happen, and, and then I'm seeing all these lines. I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> I mean, actors like to have lots of lines, and then put on top of it a, a, a great character and a great script. <laughs> We're happy. Oh, that's good. But, um, um, I just have one more quick question, if that's okay. Make, make it a good one. Make it a good one. Um, I, I never read the original comic. Were the Elite part of that original comic, or were they just created for this movie? No, the, the Elite were the villains in, in 775. They were, they were created to be sort of an analog of, um, of other, you know, dark superhero teams. Uh, so yeah, they were they were always there, and it's the exact same characters. Uh, the only difference is Cole Cast uh, has a shirt <laughs> in the film. He, he doesn't have a shirt in uh, 775. And for, and for those of you that don't know, there is a bigger arc to the story. So I'm just curious, out of all of you, how many would want to see a continuation of the story between Manchester Black and Superman? Woo! <laughs> I'm not saying I would be good. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're stuck doing it. Don't, don't even think you're getting out of it now. Thanks, Jake. Your assignment is go out on the floor tomorrow and buy Action Comics 775 and read it. Yes? Hi, I'm Maya, and I have a question for Joe. Um, when you were writing, where did you get the idea for Superman's almost cynical plan where he doesn't actually kill them and it's all a trick. It's just amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I'm really glad you liked it. Thank you. Uh, that, that I really wanted to show people what would happen if Superman went to that place, you know, like what would happen if Superman really did go bad and is it something that you'd want to see? And, you know, the answer is it's really, really scary. Like you yeah. would not want to see Superman go that way. And when he's saying things like, oh, I, I, why am I treating people like people? And I've learned, I've finally bought what you're selling. It's kind of, it's, for me, it was very sad. So uh, that was the point, really the big climax and the point of the story for me. So I wanted to just get to that and, and show that also, you know, if he wanted to, he could beat anybody that we want. I mean, at the end of the day, Superman is still pretty much, you know, the top guy. Yeah. Uh, so it was important to get to that, that place. Yeah. Woo! Great question. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Ah, someone taller. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steven. Um, this question is for Robin. Uh, you know, I, I respect all forms of stellar storytelling, especially when as a voice actor, you only have your voice, so you have to do a very good job with it. I was very impressed when I heard that you could do 70-some accents. I don't even know that many. <laughs> so, you know, I was wondering, maybe you could do a few for us, or maybe just tell us how you got to be so good at that. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, it, okay, you're really putting me on the spot here. Um, I guess, well, you've got to pick a place. So let's, let's pick England, right? Okay, so you're in England. If you're doing something from London or, you, you know, you, you want to play Batman in the next movie, you sort of go here, right? <laughs> um, and then, and sort of, you know, as you start traveling up north, your vowels sort of change. So instead of saying cup, you're saying cup. And then if you sort of right head over to Ireland, where you're going to get your feet, your, your, your teeth kicked in, <laughs> no. or you're going to go to the bar and have a pint, then, then your R's sort of change and you start heading further north and then you sort of, you know, the next thing you know, you're in How to Train Your Dragon! <laughs> you're doing Scottish, buddy, right? And it's kind of the same thing with, I don't know, the United States. You know, you start out, you're like, hey, dude, man, I grew up in California. <laughs> you know, sort of, sort of changes when you're in Texas. Sure, I suppose, yeah, yeah, you know, and then you do this, and you're in New York. And then, you know, I don't know, you just got to know. That was amazing. Thank you, Steve. That was amazing.
Hi, I'm Alicia. Um, my question was when they were inside the spaceship and there was the police box inside the transdimensional <laughs> space path. Is that a Doctor Who reference? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> in the uh, in the original comic, there were a couple of there were a lot of Easter eggs that we we couldn't really do in in all this. So, but I'm glad to see a couple might have made it through. Though I would never say that officially. <laughs> Who's up next, Maurice? Hey, my name is Justin. Uh, first off, I love when you use the word wanker in an anime film. I think that's great. Uh, my question was for Joe, um, if this is super successful, would you be interested in adapting any of the Justice League Elite stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, loved, I loved the Elite. I mean, it really, uh, it became, you know, it's funny, when I, when I first did the 775, they, they immediately said, do you want to do an Elite series? And I was like, well, no, it, it, it already exists. Like, the authority's already out there. Like, I don't need to do it. And then when Carl and I started talking about it, and it was like, well, what if it was, the Justice League, and what if the spin on it was that they were sort of undercover, and you know, it was really about can you fight monsters without you know becoming a monster yourself? Uh, that I sort of dug, and I, I had a lot of you know uh, internal conflict about whether or not we should see the Elite again. And uh, Vera being the leader of that team sort of helped. Like, okay, it's a fresh start. I know what I'm doing here. You know, and, and then we had characters on the team like Green Arrow and Batgirl and all that sort of stuff. So it really, it was a different beast for me. But that's a long way of saying yes, I love those characters. I love that they're all messed up. And in the Elite, they're even more messed up. So, because uh, they're more real. You actually care about them as people. And uh, to do that in animation would be pretty great. <laughs> My name's Alex, and my question is, if this is such a big battle, why isn't Superman getting help from the Justice League? <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent question. Were they on vacation? <laughs> they all had their cell phones turned off, and they, uh, they're busy on the uh, ninth moon of Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, we honestly were not allowed to sort of even talk about them. The, there was a scene, uh, the scene where Lois is actually saying to, um, to Superman, why don't you call somebody else? In the original dialogue, it said, why don't you call the Justice League? And um, we wanted to make sure that the story was just about Superman. So, yeah, they are out there. I mean, they, they exist in the, in the big world, but we just couldn't play with all those toys, so that's why. Gotta be, give me a Gotta be, give me a I tell you, go, go down.